So while that Justice Department yeah. investigation continues, these cases against people who were at the Capitol go on as well. And a potentially key development in the case against several Proud Boys leaders charged with seditious conspiracy, a federal judge ruled yesterday prosecutors can use this video of then-President Donald Trump during the trial. What do you want to call him? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white like me to condemn? White Proud Boys. Proud and right Proud Proud Boys. Boys. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right-wing problem, his this own is a left-wing. That, of course, the infamous moment when Donald Trump made his stand back and stand by comment at the presidential debate in September of 2020. District Judge Timothy Kelly said those words showed a, quote, additional motive to advocate for Mr. Trump and engage in the charge conspiracy to keep Trump in power. Prosecutors yeah. and Proud Boys members who testified before the January 6th House committee said the comments were celebrated by the far right group, and they were, and used as a recruited tool. Five members of the group are on trial, accused of planning to attack the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. It's a statement of fact because we know it from testimony that these Proud Boys and other groups took that moment on that stage with the world watching a presidential debate as a signal. Get ready. Yeah, we've seen that video hundreds, if not thousands of times. It's galling each time that he cannot condemn these groups. And we know uh, from talking to people around him that he understood that some of these hate groups, these far right groups, Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, you name them, that some of them were his supporters. A lot of them were his supporters. And of course, we saw what they did, the role they played, therefore, on January 6th. So, Barbara, let me come to you here. We know the context of this, um, but how legally significant is it that these comments, these stand back, stand by, uh, uttered by Trump in that debate with Joe Biden back in 2020, can now be used in these seditious conspiracy trials uh, stemming from January 6th riot? Well, I think it's significant in the case against the Proud Boys because that was a, uh, a signal for them that began some of their recruiting mm -hmm. and was a unifying cause. Uh, that was part of their conspiracy. And what prosecutors has, have to prove is an agreement to do this attack. And so that was something that ignited the recruiting, the communication, uh, the travel to Washington and what they did. So very significant in that case. Whether it can be used against Donald Trump, it, as awful as it is, uh, it reminds me a lot of the statement that he made when he said, Russia, if you're listening, uh, we're looking mm -hmm. for yeah. Hillary Clinton's emails. You have to show an agreement to tie someone to a conspiracy. And so making a random comment, even if it was igniting to a particular group, probably is not enough for a conspiracy standing alone. Now, if there is evidence that others, Roger Stone and Mike Flynn, some of these people who've been seen with some of these seditious conspirators on January 6th and before, uh, if you can tie them to part of the agreement to attack the Capitol, then that is a possible way to draw Trump and his allies into the seditious conspiracy. I think the other uh, crime that the committee recommended was inciting insurrection, uh, you know, providing the inspiration, lighting the match that caused people to attack. Uh, because the Supreme Court provides so much protection for political speech, I don't know if that gets you there. But I'll tell you the part that does possibly get you there that I thought was a brilliant move by the committee, which was to include in the, the uh, recommended charge assisting insurrection with the 2.24 p.m. tweet that occurred after the attack had started, saying Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what was necessary and the United States demands the truth. That one put fuel on the fire and I think could be a basis for assisting an insurrection against Donald Trump. You know, Mike Allen, there's, a, there's right now a big uh, friction between the law and politics. Um, you take a prosecution, like for instance, against the guy who almost beat Ron DeSantis in 2018, Andrew Gillum. Uh, the feds had a, a years-long investigation against him and charged him ultimately, uh, I think it took him about six years to charge him for, for after uh, with some of the things that he did began. And, and I was just uh, commenting to people uh, in, in Tallahassee when, when he got charged. I said, how long has this been going on? They said the feds have been investigating him for years. That's what the FBI does. That's what the DOJ does. They take their time before they roll them up and they make sure there's a reason why they have such a high conviction rate, because it takes a long time. They get the job done. But 
You take Merrick They're Garland, really now point. to the political side of it, I don't think I've ever seen a guy attacked by both sides more than this guy. The <laughs> left hates him. The right hates him. He's too slow. He's too fast. What, I mean, he's, he is really stuck in the middle of, of politics. I'm curious, you're reporting on it. What's his opinion of it? Uh, and and what, what do the rank and file members of the DOJ think about uh, this push and pull from the left and right? Yeah, Joe, your point, this is what the DOJ does. That is so true about federal prosecutors. Another piece of reporting in that post story that leapt out at me that bolsters your point is the fact that the January 6th grand jury has accelerated the testimony that's getting from witnesses. And here, as a country lawyer, Joe, this part will uh, perk up your ears. They're hearing from witnesses high and low who were involved in mm -hmm. these events. So the between the lines, the through line between the, the, the parts of this story is that they're casting an exceedingly wide net. And what we can see with each of these pieces is they're documenting forensically. What is the difference between what has been said and what was done publicly and what was in people's minds? What did they know what was going on? The Post points out in the case of those voting machines, like it does what was being uh, known and said behind the scenes, does that show that people knew that what was being said was false? And you're right, atop all of this, Attorney General Garland and uh, what he's done has been what the White House has done is saying, we're letting the prosecutors do their work. It's what they did when they brought in the special prosecutor on the Trump documents case. Uh, but just reminding everybody, you don't bring in a special prosecutor typically to decide nothing happened. Uh, Michael, we want to get back to the book. In, in uh, the paperback, you have another new section. Explain that behind closed doors in 2017, President Trump discussed the idea of using a nuclear weapon against North Korea and suggesting that he could blame a U.S. strike oh, on another geez. country. Oh, my God. So, God. I mean, God. evolution. Oh, my God. Help God. us. Oh, the the, oh, the evolution worse. of the North oh. Korea and the relationship with Kim Jong-un is fascinating. I was there in the DMZ when he stepped over the line to shake Kim Jong-un's hand. But that's 2019. Back in 2017, it was fire and fury and potentially a nuclear attack. Tell us about it. So I what mean, I learned is that behind closed doors in front of his aides, Trump would talk cavalierly about using force against North Korea. And there were deep concerns about this because um, Trump was saying things publicly that were signaling the potential of military conflict. It's eight days after Kelly comes in that Trump says fire and fury. And what happens is, is that Trump is, 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 is saying privately what he's saying publicly. So if you're a foreign country and you know that Trump is saying behind closed doors that he is publicly, then you think, oh man, what is he going to do? And I think the concerns in the West Wing at the time were that Kim, fearing that the United States was gonna do something, may try and do something himself. Right. Or a general Perhaps. who was working for Kim would try and do something that he thought Kim would want. And, and if North Korea were to do something like that, let's say they were to shoot a missile at the United States or into South Korea, the United States may be able to stop that, but it would set off a conflict that could easily spiral out of control. And Kelly knew that on one hand, you had Kim, who had to, to uh, was a dictator, who had to appeal to his elites to stay in power, and you had Trump, who was as insecure a person as Kelly had ever seen. So he's, he's fearful that these two people are going to set off a massive military conflict. And you have to remember, John Kelly is a four-star Marine general who had spent his life studying conflict. He had been study he had studied war. He had gone to war. He had he understood the consequences of it, but he also understood the history of it and how these things could easily a miss signal here, a miss signal there is the kind of thing that could set off a conflict. And what could he do to de-escalate that? And you have to wonder which country he had in mind to blame if he attacked. Was it going to be South Korea and get South Korea attacked by North Korea? 
Washington correspondent for the New York Times, Michael Schmidt, is out next week with the paperback edition of his book, Donald Trump versus the United States. And among the new material featured in it is a 13,000 word profile of former President Donald Trump's longest serving chief of staff, John Kelly. Remember him? The profile brings to light several details, including Kelly's role behind Trump's pivot from trying to provoke North Korean leader Kim Jong-un to befriending him. It reads in part this, Kelly told the president that engaging with Kim could prove once and for all that he was the greatest salesman in the world. In one-on-one -on -one conversations, Kelly tried to gently nudge Trump away from his incendiary language toward North Korea, telling him that he could unintentionally set off a conflict if his language was misread. You're pushing him to prove he's a man, Kelly said to Trump. If you push him into a corner, he may strike out. You don't want to box him in. Let's bring in Michael Schmidt right now. Michael, there, there, there wow. are so many revelations here. Uh, one has to do with the fact how shocked uh, General Kelly was at just how ignorant Donald Trump was of the basics of foreign policy. And they often try to explain to people that what people consider to be maniacal by Donald Trump is just sheer ignorance at times. In the early days of Kelly's tenure as chief of staff, Trump showed he had no grasp on the basics of American foreign policy. Quote, why did we go to war in North Korea? Kelly then explained the basics of the Korean War to the president. Why the blank are we in NATO, he would ask Kelly. Mm -hmm. Kelly, since Trump's question didn't have to do with philosophical arguments, he just didn't understand it. Kelly explained, sir, it came as a result of World War II. Also something that kicked up a lot of dust, uh, the Atlantic wrote an article about Donald Trump calling people uh, losers who had gotten killed in a war and yeah. a lot of people were accusatory saying, oh, they, they just made that quote up. You reveal here, it actually was, it actually was General Kelly uh, why the blank do we think they're heroes, uh, soldiers who are injured or died in war? They're getting too much praise. They're losers, Donald Trump said. Um, that, of course, was it not, Michael, one of the things that and his hatred for John McCain, one of the things that uh, ended their relationship? Yeah, uh, let, let's deal with the, the most important part of the this this 12,000 word thing that I've put on the paperback of my book and we'll get to it. And that is that in the in the piece, I write that Kelly kept, had to keep an eye on Morning Joe because despite what Donald Trump was saying publicly, Donald Trump was watching Morning Joe and watching what you were saying about him and uh, would come down from the residence around 11 o'clock in the morning and complain about what he heard on Morning Joe. So despite yeah. claiming not to watch it, he was watching it. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, with, by, by, by the way, we, we, we heard that from a lot of staff members. Uh, and by the way, hi, Donald. Yeah, uh, he's, st he's still stop. watching. Uh, we begged him to stop watching. Leave but, us but, alone. But he wouldn't do it. But again, let, let's talk about, though, uh, this, this, yeah. this reveal of Donald Trump that many people have known about. But he just, John Kelly just... He learned that Donald Trump just didn't know a lot about foreign policy. So when Kelly came in as chief of staff, he thought that the problem around Trump was that he was not staffed properly and that they needed to create a process around him. And that's what the chaos of the first six months of the administration was about. But when Kelly comes in as chief of staff, what he realizes is that the problem is not just the fact that there's not a process and, and that he's not being staffed as well as he could, but that Trump himself was the problem, that Trump was far dumber and immoral and ignorant and and lazy than he ever thought he was. And within a few days, he becomes terrified because here he is, the top staffer to the president of the United States, and he's realizing that the president of the United States is far more uh, limited and potentially dangerous than he ever thought. And at that point, there was no one else to call. He was he w it was just him and Trump. And he basically spends the next 18 months trying to manage Trump as much as he could.
and no issue for Kelly sort of uh, typified the shortcomings of Trump and the, the potential dangers that he presented then North Korea. Yeah, and, and let's talk about a, a, another uh, aspect of it that was shocking to John Kelly, uh, how shallow Donald Trump was when he would select people. I remember during the transition talking to him and him talking about how Rex Tillerson was big and he looked like the role. He loved Mattis because of Mattis's nickname, Mad Dog. His name's Mad Dog. I love it. I'm going to get this guy. He didn't like Petraeus because he thought Petraeus worked out too much. He was too drawn in. He weighed the same in high school that he weighed uh, when Trump was talking to him. And no secretary mm -hmm. of state could be that drawn. I'm, I'm serious. It's, no, I this watched is, this conversation the, 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 in the, awe. This is shocking. And, he and was obsessed with how he, much he worked out and thought that somehow it didn't look manly enough, like you need to not care so much. Right, and, and, and so all of this leads up, of course, to a conversation, and this is, the general talked about all of this with you, but it led up to a conversation about Nikki Haley, oh. why he didn't want mm. Nikki Haley to be a secretary of state or vice president. What Trump said, so Trump is throwing around different possibilities for replacements of uh, Tillerson and, at, and Pence, even as far back as uh, 2018, talking about whether he could replace Pence. And in discussing that, he says, well, what do you, you know, what, what do you think about Nikki Haley, he throws out in the Oval Office. And um, what Trump says is that she doesn't look good for me, and he complains about her blotchy complexion and saying that, you know, because of her aesthetics, he didn't like her as a potential, uh, you know, senior administration official or as a potential vice presidential replacement for Pence, who Trump was complaining as far back as then owed him, that Pence owed him because Trump had saved Pence from political ruin when he picked him in 2016 to be his vice president. Yeah, I mean, Willie, obviously. Uh, shocking and yet not surprising at all. I mean, the only question this I This from a man. I, I, I was going to say, I was just going to ask, do they not have mirrors in Mar-a-Lago? <laughs> I think they have mostly mirrors in Mar-a-Lago based on the decor I've seen from some of the photographs. Yeah. The quote uh, he said, Donald Trump, according to General Kelly, is of, of Nikki Haley, she has that skin thing. She doesn't look good for what? me. What? Didn't That's like her, crazy. Her, her complexion, he said. There was something wrong. I don't know what he's talking about there. Um, I don't bigger, bigger picture, Mike. He was damn? among, General Kelly, like Mattis and others, among those who said privately and then publicly later, I stayed in because the alternative was catastrophic for the country. If I leave, Rudy Giuliani comes in. If I leave, person X comes in, and there are no guardrails left. Um, how did he now, with some distance from it, and he was in the room with Donald Trump while all this was happening, trying to keep things on the rails. How did he talk about his time in there and how long he decided to stay and when he decided to leave? So one of the things about Kelly is that he has not really spoken publicly and he won't he really won't talk publicly. He I did an interview with him that ran in The New York Times uh, about a month ago about him talking about Trump trying to weaponize the IRS. But he will not talk publicly about Trump because uh, or not much about Trump because he sees his role as like a general who believes the divide between the, the military and politics is essential. Now, this frustrates a lot of people. And, and it you know, people have often wanted Kelly to speak out publicly more than he has. But I think he's extremely conflicted by the fact that, um, that, that he is a four-star Marine general and that that divide between politics and, and who he is is important. Viewpoint of those who are uh, acting responsibly. Joining us now, Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace of South Carolina. Congresswoman, it's good to see you again. On this issue, um, wh what do you think can be done? Do you think it is um, at all a strategy here just to let him in that seat and not to address the situation? 
I hope that's not the strategy. Uh, number one, I, I love these New York Republicans. Uh, what's not to love about them? They're calling it out. They call it like they see it. They're calling out their own colleague, George Santos, in this particular situation. Um, it is a problem for us in Congress because the American people, they don't trust anybody. They think all politicians lie, and there are good guys among us who are trying to do the right thing. He should resign, but obviously he won't. You saw in the clip earlier, he's smiling and almost giggling when the press Mm -hmm. uh, gaggle is following him around. He's enjoying, loving, I would argue, the attention that he's getting right now. Um, there are a couple of different processes to get someone out of Congress like this. The first would be via the Judiciary Committee um, having a hearing and putting forth a resolution that gets voted out of Judiciary to come to the floor. I don't see that happening right now. But what you do see are serious questions, uh, possible criminal investigations. If you're looking at his campaign expenses, there are some suspicious activity there. And then if you're looking at uh, possible ethics investigations. We have an ethics committee. Um, I hope that every that he's got goes through the ringer here. Uh, he deserves due process, but he needs to get out. And I agree with the New York Post and his colleagues in New yeah. York on both sides of the aisle on this one. It's yeah, a sideshow. Terrible. By the way, Nassau Republicans, I found out firsthand from Peter King, can be pretty tough. He was a moderate. I was a conservative. And when he got mad at me, he told the Washington Post, Scarborough just walked out of a tent revival in the deep south barefoot. And so you don't need to listen to him. Um, so so um, I, I, I feel for you and other Republicans that want to talk issues. It's mm -hmm. one of the problems we had with Newt Gingrich is he would say these fiery things and it would be on the front page of uh, newspapers for a month or so. But We've been talking this morning about all the distractions that are out there. And I know this has been a concern of yours. Mm -hmm. I know you want to talk about, you know, uh, the cost of housing, the cost of, of gas, the cost of bread, the cost of other groceries, the cost of uh, so many issues that matter. But it seems that for every issue you want to talk about, there seems to be another distraction coming out. Uh, and as I say on the show every day, it's as if my former republicly, my former party hasn't learned from the past re-election, the past election results. I would, I would agree. I've said that all week. We have not learned from the midterm elections. We haven't learned uh, post row what really upsets and angers Americans. I represent a swing district. When I came into Congress two years ago, I won by one point. And when my, my district was redrawn last year, I got a point and a half better. Not much of a margin. But I learned and figured out how, as a conservative, to reach across the aisle in my first two years in office and deliver results and talk about issues that matter. The number one issue in the swing district that I represent, of course, was inflation. But the number two issue was abortion. And is an issue that Republicans mm -hmm. um, didn't do very well on this summer after Roe. Uh, right, racing to the fringes on either side of the aisle is not where about 90% of Americans are. Um, it's an issue that I care about deeply. I even had to run uh, an ad about my own rape as a teenager. As I wanted people to know, I want women to know that I was going to find a way to balance women's rights and the right to life because I am pro-life. But there's got to be a balance there. And so, uh, you know, we have to be very vocal on issues that matter. Inflation and abortion were the top two issues. I'm not the only swing district in the country, but those were important issues. And we've got to deliver something that both Republicans and Democrats alike can be on the same page. I mean, we have a divided Congress. We've got to work together. Yeah. And so you, I want to just develop on that issue with that lesson post row in the midterms. Mm -hmm. What was the lesson that was learned about how many Republican women and men uh, care about this issue and feel differently than what was previously assumed? And how can you get the message to your fellow Republicans about how to deal with this? Because it is a critical issue and some that some Republicans campaign on on the other side of it. Right. And I, you know, I'm pro-life, but the vast majority of people in my district didn't agree with Roe right. being overturned. And we would hold town hall after town hall trying to find and talk about that common ground and not racing to the fringes. And I would ask my colleagues, you know, show some compassion to women, show compassion, especially to rape victims or girls who are victims of incest. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, we've got to show love and compassion, even when we disagree and not act like alpha hotels sometimes, which is what we do um, on some of these issues, because we want to beat our 
support chess and we want the base to, to love us, but I just proved in this election, I had two big elections this year, a primary, a big primary and a big general election that you can stay true to your principles and your values, you can find middle ground and you can win big. And that's the lesson I learned that many of my colleagues haven't quite figured it out yet. And I am very worried about our agenda. Um, I know that there are other swing district Republicans mm. that we want to stay in the majority and we're going to have to be vocal sooner rather than later. We're going to have to come together and find a dozen of us who are going to put a stop to some of this when it happens. Congresswoman, it, it, it's really fascinating what happened in Kansas is, I think, is one of the more right. remarkable election outcomes in quite some time. I never saw it coming. That was supposed to be a 50 50. Uh, and um, you, you, you know, we always talk about how two things can be true at the same time. And you brought it up. There are a lot right. of people who are pro-life who've identified as being pro-life their entire life. And at the same time, they don't think Roe should have been overturned. David French, it reminds me, David French, who's always been pro-life, said we can't allow courts to push this on the American people by judicial fiat. We're going to have to actually go out and start making the argument, making the pro-life argument and explaining what we're doing. And love you to comment on that, first of all. But secondly, like you to comment on the fact of, of, of how much damage the examples of, like, for instance, of, of what we saw, the 10-year-old girl raped in Ohio that yeah. had to flee the state, uh, the Michigan gubernatorial candidate saying a 14-year-old girl being raped by her uncle is a perfect reason why there can't be exceptions. Can you talk about how shrill and how out of touch that is, not just with right. swing voters, but with Republican voters in your district? Right. Well, now, just this week, the I believe it was the governor of Alabama said that women should be thrown in prison if they take uh, a, an abortion pill. So, oh. I mean, Plan B is something that 90 percent of America supports. Uh, women shouldn't be thrown in prison. Neither should doctors at this juncture either. Um, but one of the things that I've been harping on this week and for months now is that if we're going to get serious about saving lives, right, if we were serious about that issue, um, we have to have legislation that will pass a Democrat-controlled Senate and a Republican-controlled House. One of the things that we could do right now is giving women access to birth control. If you want to get serious about saving lives and protecting women's rights, then every woman should ha have access to birth control. In South Carolina, we have entire counties and rural areas that don't have a single OBGYN doctor. So if we want to get serious about saving lives, let's get serious about it. And that is something that people on both sides of the aisle can champion and get behind, and it's something that could be, be sworn be passed into law by the president of the United States. But, you know, we're racing to the fringes. There's a, I have a colleague in the House right now that wants to bring a bill to the floor that bans all abortions with no exceptions. What are we doing here? That's not where 90 percent of the country is, especially Republicans. I've polled the issue over and over and over again. And I, I would argue the vast majority, not just in my district, but across the state of South Carolina, they agree with us on this one. So, Congresswoman, the fringes and that extremism you're talking about there certainly played into the outcome of the midterm elections a couple of months ago, where the House was much closer than I know a lot of you all would have liked it to be or expected it to have been, and the Democrats actually picked up a seat in the Senate. So with some distance now, how do you assess what happened and what needs to change inside your party to broaden its appeal? Do you think, for example, your party needs to untether itself from Donald Trump? Well, I would argue, and there were even some seats in Colorado, for example, where it was very close. We had an R plus nine seat that, that the person won by about 500 votes. Right. So we do have a messaging issue and messaging on issues. Inflation is the number one issue across the aisle. People are worried about the cost of everything, as Joe mentioned earlier. That is something we have to address without harming Social Security. That is a message we have to get across. I have a bill called the Penny Plan that Rand Paul does every cycle in the Senate. I do the House companion bill. It balances the budget in 10 years without touching Social Security. Uh, we've got to have the right message on economic issues because Republicans and Democrats alike, they've got both had problems with deficit spending and running it up uh, and have caused inflation to happen. Number one. Number two, you know, we're, most people are fiscally conservative, but they tend to be socially moderate. Um, we've got to have a compassionate message that embraces women that agree and disagree with Roe. Uh, that is an important issue this summer. I saw it 
over and over again in my district. I would have town halls and women would show up very angry about it and wanted to know what the plan was. And we have to have a plan that is grounded, that is, is middle of the road and brings both sides together. It is a very important issue. Um, crime and immigration is another place where, you know, we have to figure that out, the border, securing the border. But at the same time, you know, a lot of people, we have a lot of jobs that are needed. So what are we going to do to fix the visa issues um, that we have here, which by and large would fix immigration if we could get and discuss the policy about it, uh, raising those caps that are arbitrarily low when we have a lot of jobs that people could do here and then go back home after nine months. But we've got to talk about real issues that are affecting real communities. And right now we're distracted by last week. We're distracted by the agenda this week. We're distracted by George Santos. We can't get to the meat of the problems that our country is facing right now. And if that continues, we're going to have a very difficult time two years from now. And you're going to hear me, my voice. I'll be very strong and very loud about the issues that matter in my state and in my country because it's just too important to ignore. And do you think to the second part of my question, Congresswoman, at this point in 2023 that Donald Trump is a net positive or a net negative for your party? I hope when it comes to presidential politics that we have a very uh, large, wide, and deep presidential candidate field. I want to see us, whomever our nominee is, look towards the future and not towards the past. That hurt us in the midterm elections, and we've got to have someone that can bring together conservatives, independents, left of center, and right of center. And if we don't have that in our nominee in 24, we're going to lose the White House. We might even lose the U.S. House. Bring in Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter of California, who just announced her bid for the United States Senate in that state. We'll get to that in just a moment, Congresswoman. But first, an update from your district. It appears there's really no part of your state untouched by this weather. The severe storms are a terrible problem, and they're going to continue. And what they're evidence of is the urgency of addressing climate change. California has seen severe weather of all different types, from long, wild, long, terrible wildfires to now these storms. We need to elect a senator who can address this, who won't be beholden to big oil, and who understands that our country is in crisis. And we need leaders who can tackle that. Um, and I'm ready to do exactly that. I'm anxious to get back home and see my kids, dry them off and make sure they're safe. So, uh, Congressman Porter, I'm curious, I'm looking at your campaign uh, material, and you talk about being, that California really needs a warrior in Washington. What would make you different than the warriors right now in the Senate, representing California? Well, in my six year, four years in the House and six years campaigning, I haven't done things like they've always been done. I don't take corporate PAC money. I'm one of only a handful of Congress people who turn down federal lobbyist money. And I'm willing to use whatever tools I have to try to engage the American public. So you've seen me in hearings how committed I am to oversight. There are warriors in the Senate, and our Senator Dianne mm -hmm. Feinstein is one of those people. Um, and I am honored to be following in the footsteps of such a trailblazer blazer, someone who has made so many opportunities for women in politics in California. Well, she hasn't announced, though, that she's retiring yet, has she? She has not yet announced. She said she'll make a decision when she's ready, and that's exactly what she should do. She should take her time to make her decision, and she said that it's what all of us should do. Yeah, did, but I've made uh, my decision, you, uh, and I'm ready. Right. <laughs> have, have, have you spoken to her? Did you speak to her before you made the announcement that you were going to be running against her? Before I announced, I reached out to the senator. I was not able to connect, um, but I'm looking forward to hopefully getting a chance to, to have her call back and to sit down with her. She has so much to teach all of us, um, and there's so much about her, her willingness to fight for the ban on assault weapons, her ability to help expose torture at Guantanamo. She is an amazing leader, and I'm looking forward to continuing to learn from her and to serve with her representing California in the Congress. There was there was first open speculation and then reporting on the fact that uh, she may no longer be up to serving because of her age uh, and and some some challenges uh, that she's facing. Uh, is that one of the reasons why you decided to run? Do you think Diane Feinstein is not up to serving the people of California anymore? 
Senator Feinstein is serving the people of California right now. She's voting on bills and making a difference. My decision, and I really want to emphasize this, is mine. And I am the kind mm -hmm. of person who has always been willing to step up and to lead. And I think one of the things I've learned from Senator Feinstein is you need to be willing to step up. You need to be willing to take on tough fights. And that's what I expect this Senate race to be. But I've always had tough campaigns, and I've always won, and I hope this will be the exact same result. Congresswoman Porter, good morning, Jonathan Lemire. Uh, you obviously have your eyes on the Senate, but currently still in the House. So I want to get your sense of w your perception of the early days of this new Congress, Republicans in charge, a fellow Californian, Kevin McCarthy, as House Speaker with chaotic vote, and now a new rules package. What is your uh, estimation as the ability to get things done across the aisle, particularly with some huge fights looming, uh, including over government funding and the debt ceiling? Well, I think what we're seeing is more evidence, sadly, tragically, that Washington is broken. And I think this, what this is reinforcing to the American people is that the folks they send to Washington are not able to come together and to govern. And so, you know, I think that what we've seen from Republicans so far is they're pushing bills um, that have no chance of passing in the Senate, that are about, uh, that are really performative, and they're putting our economy, our entire economy at risk. And we already have too much of our economy at risk because Washington is beholden to special interests. I will never be, and I will fight to make sure we have an economy that works for everyone. That means being responsible about things like the debt ceiling. Congresswoman, just going back to the campaign for a moment, because we just got some news into us this morning at NBC News that Senator Elizabeth Warren already has endorsed you in the Senate race. I understand she was your old law school professor as well. Um, it's likely to be a big field, uh, regardless of whether Senator Feinstein runs again. Uh, you'll have... Adam Schiff, Ro Khanna, Barbara Lee has privately expressed some interest. So what sets you apart within that field from a group of progressives? Why are you the right choice among them? Well, I think it's my willingness to fight corruption. Um, I helped lead the ban on stock trading. I don't take corporate PAC money and never have. I'm one of only a half dozen or so lawmakers who refuse federal lobbyist money. I've shown in hearing after hearing, whether it's big banks or big oil or big pharma, I'm willing to call those out who are hurting the American people. I have a real commitment to oversight, and I'm willing to do that oversight on either party if necessary. Republicans bear a lot of the responsibility for the destruction of our democracy and the attacks on our democracy in the last few years. But we have to be honest, some members of our own party are not helping. And I think I would really stand out for my record in doing that. I'm also from a swing district. I represent Orange County. I've helped win over voters there, win over Republicans and independents. And I think I'd bring that energy to campaigning across California and ultimately across the country to help us make sure that Democrats win majorities in the House and the Senate this cycle and for years to come. And only 22 months till Election Day. A long road ahead. Mm. Democratic Congresswoman Katie Porter of California, thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you.